Welcome back to our program. Today we're focusing attention on the Parliamentarians for Global Action uh, to take a look at what they're doing to promote world peace as well as to enhance human rights and also to, also to work on economic and social development. My guest is someone who's very involved with this group. My guest today is Shazia Rafi, who is the Secretary General of the Parliamentarians for Global Action. Ms. Rafi, a Pakistani national, has an MA from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. Shazia Rafi, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you. Pleased to be here, Bill. I appreciate you being with me. Parliamentarians for Global Action, what exactly is this group? When was it formed? Why was it formed? And what does it do? It's an association of le national legislators, members of Congress and Senate from 131 countries around the world. Um, they have to be elected parliaments, um, and it was formed in 1978 in Washington, D.C., by then Congressman Paul Simon, who later became Senator Paul Simon. Um, and its first uh, uh, sort of campaign was to get the comprehensive treaty against nuclear testing. So it works by um, getting agreement on international treaties which are worked at uh, jointly with the UN system, both here, Geneva, and uh, also in other parts of the world, um, to get agreement on a framework for peace, rule of law, social development, but doing it through treaties, their ratification, their implementing legislation, and the role that parliaments can play in both uh, the foreign policy and as well as in uh, social development. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, you have to be a member of parliament or Absolutely. Congress or something like that. Sitting member of an sitting elected, member. Sitting mm -hmm. member of an elected legislature. Mm -hmm. Now you're the secretary general yes. for the Parliamentarians for Global Action which we say is PGA, we're, we're not confusing it with Professional Golfers Association. No, for our unfortunately, golfing we, don't, we don't have their uh, funding either. So. <laughs> well, they do have sufficient That's funding. Right. That's, That's right. right. But what do you do as Secretary General? Well, the Secretary General is um, in some ways like the chef of the restaurant. Um, you know, in terms of conceiving the actual uh, work plan, the ideas that come from members, working with a board of directors which are elected on two-year terms, members of parliament from around the world, um, and working s with senior level officials from within the UN system who are part of a UN committee of advisors. The current chair is the ambassador of Argentina to make sure that the work that we are doing uh, on this third leg of uh, governments internationally, which is the work of legislatures, ties in and is in tandem with what governments are agreeing to work on in the UN agenda. Mm -hmm. And you have a very interesting website, pgaction.org. That's right. So if our viewers would like more information Absolutely. on your organization, they just go to pgaction.org Absolutely. and they'll find a lot more. So i uh, just curious though, how many are all of the legislatures in the world, all the parliaments, members, are there others that are freely elected, democratically elected, that no. do not participate for one reason or another? For one reason or another, no. I think um, at this moment our membership is from 131 countries around the world. Mm -hmm. um, there probably is another 20 or so that are eligible under the rules, uh, which which do require for there to be more than one political party, for there to be, um, you know, full adult franchise, uh, mm -hmm. men and women, um, the ability of women also to stand uh, mm -hmm. for election, as well as um, their, the, the right to stand as independents. Mm -hmm. So That's that, but it does cover uh, quite a large uh, number of the world. And our memberships on an individual basis. So we have over about 1,300 members within our network, mm -hmm. um, and it renews based on when they're in and out of office. Mm -hmm. That is a large percentage because there are, there are 193 countries in the United Nations, all the That's countries right. of the world, That's right. and you have a large number of them that are members of your group, so it's, it's quite a few. That's right. Yes. Well, we've looked, we've seen how violence flares in many different ways. Mm -hmm. that, we see it in different ways right now in South Sudan. There are conflicts between various ethnic groups, tribes against mm -hmm. one another. We've seen that in the Democratic Republic of Congo there have been challenges and that type of thing. If we think back not too long ago, thankfully that's not the situation today, but just take Sierra Leone as an example mm -hmm. of the conflict that raged there for many years. Thousands, tens of thousands of people died in that bloody conflict. But you also had a situation where you had child soldiers who were abducted and taken into the, mm -hmm. forced into working with a particular militia group or whatever the case might be. Right. And 
does your group deal with this? I know you're promoting world peace, international cooperation, and that type of thing, but do you look at uh, the child soldier situation as uh, one that's a serious problem, although it's not in Sierra Leone right now, but it was not too many Something years ago? Um, well, we look at something of the, you know, the conflict of the nature that uh, took place in Sierra Leone through various uh, ways that we've worked on uh, mm -hmm. conflicts of that nature. One is we worked on conflict prevention. Um, our organization was very instrumental in working with the countries that are part of the West African ECOWAS mm -hmm. in even helping set up ECOWAS um, and building the regional peace building mechanisms that eventually bring these wars to a close, try to prevent them, bring them to a close and come to an agreement. Um, the second thing is that we've been working on the Small Arms and Light Weapons Convention and you know the ECOWAS region in particular went ahead with that convention and the, and the protocols related to it. On a global level we're working on the Arms Trade Treaty which as you know this year is the main push to get a legally binding Arms Trade Treaty to at least regulate the legal trade. Now that doesn't affect the illegal trade that militias and others are using in these horrible conflicts. Uh, so easily, but it's a first step in that direction. Um, with regard to the crimes of, against humanity that are committed and the rules of war in a certain sense, if one may call them, uh, that are broken uh, by bringing in children into these conflicts, part of what we're doing on the rule of law end is we were the organization that were instrumental in getting the International Criminal Court first suggested at the UN in 89, then agreed in 98 in Rome, then ratified by 2002. Um, so we're at the forefront of making sure that countries um, begin to accept, adhere to, and enforce, uh, you know, a global set of principles uh, of rule of law and human rights. At the same time, I think part of what we are working on is on the social development side to be able to come up with policies related to uh, the UN's principles on the Millennium Development Goals so that some of the push factors on an economic basis uh, don't drag many of these regions into further conflict with each other. And mm -hmm. that's particularly important this year, which is the year on climate change, um, because the next items of conflict will be on things like water and others, which are you know, even more scarce resources than oil and others that we've seen in the past. Mm -hmm. that, that is ex exactly right. In fact, many of the foreign policy observers are predicting that water is going to be the, o the petroleum of the 21st century because of climate change. We see weather patterns changing. Mm -hmm. We see a situation where groups are fighting one another over very small parcels of water, in some cases mud holes, right. and you have two groups that are trying to have access to the to what little water is there, but it's going to be a major problem. In fact, it already is a major already problem is. right now. Certainly is. is. Well, you, you mentioned several items we wanted to, to touch upon. One is disarmament. Uh, do you, you're involved in promoting that. What, how do you see that discussion moving forward? It's, it's been one that has moved at sort of a glacial pace yeah. over the past several years, and of course, the UN has tried to keep that front and center. I know Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, that's been one of his top priorities. But how do you see that moving forward in the future and maybe what can be done to help move it even faster? Well, I think it's one of those where, unfortunately, you know, unlike other crimes where it's very clear cut that nobody is in favor of genocide. Um, here, it is one where governments have both an export role in the, in the production of weapons, in the buying of weapons, and even in sometimes the use of weapons. Um, at the same time, there is a need to control and to ensure that they don't get into the hands of illegal actors and uh, you know terrorists and militias. So it is one where it is harder to control as a result, but I do see the momentum increasing because while the violence level is increasing, and it's not just in terms of war, it's also if you look at you know the border across between Mexico and the U.S., it's, it's war of uh, another nature and violence, armed violence of another nature. We just held our annual forum this year on the theme of armed violence and development covering both, you know, war and peacetime situations and the use of small arms. Um, I do see that the awareness level among legislators is rising, among people is rising, and as, you know, that awareness level and the push of uh, a global treaty, at least to begin with the, um, you know, the, the legal trade, it will create that momentum uh, going forward. 
Um, and it's one where it's part of that also that whole notion of human security that, you know, your security is not enhanced by how many weapons you have. It's how many less weapons everybody has uh, mm -hmm. in a community, in a region, in the world. Um, I think on coming to the issue for the, other, the second issue for us this year is the issue on climate change. And there actually, um, I think the UN is the only body that really can begin to play a role. I'm just coming actually just yesterday, off, day before yesterday, off the flight from uh, Delhi, where about a thousand cars a day are added to the, metro to the metropolis. And even if all of them are on natural gas, clean natural gas, you still are adding a huge burden to the, uh, to the city. Mm -hmm. At mm -hmm. the same time, you've got the needs of a growing economy um, and people getting jobs in that growing economy and then beginning to consume and spend at the same levels as we do here. So it's, it, it has a huge toll on environmental health. It has a huge toll on, you know, the rise of respiratory diseases. At the same time, it's one of these things where people still have to have energy to be able to grow their economy. So all these elements need to come together. And there's a role that legislators, NGOs, and governments can play together. And this is the forum mm -hmm. in which we can come together to do it. We're talking about uh, climate change okay. and how this is so important. Does your, do you see within your group that they're starting to, or maybe they've seen this for many years, that this may be the number one problem affecting the world right now, all seven billion people in the world? I know there are financial problems. Nuclear disarmament is a problem. We have others, but do they see climate change, and if it unfolds in a negative way, the way we're talking about it certainly well could, and the scientific data point in that direction that there are going to be even more problems, major problems over the horizon. Absolutely. I think that, you know, uh, our members have been working on this since 92 when uh, we worked with uh, the UN Environment Program um, to hold a very big session on Agenda 21, which at that stage um, the keynote speaker was then Senator Al Gore. Uh, so this group of parliamentarians has been working on getting a strong international agreement uh, for Agenda 21, for the Kyoto Protocols, for all the, the relevant in international instruments and to get them implemented at the national and local level. Uh, we've also had um, two years ago our annual forum hosted by the U.S. Senate on energy and environment management. Um, where several members who've been very active in this, including Congressman Ed Markey and others, you know, spoke about the, the efforts they were making um, uh, on environmental legislation. It's, it's just that it's a very difficult task because it ties into all the pressures that legislatures have of both providing for jobs in this sort of economic downturn uh, in the short run while also balancing the needs of um, the climate and the environment um, in the long run. And somehow the other, the two have to be made to work in tandem. Um, and this is one of the things which as legislators, uh, I know that both men and women are particularly concerned about women in particular, because it's, it's affecting their um, lives in many ways, including when air is polluted, when water is polluted, it is they as caregivers in their homes who are suffering. Uh, it's taking them longer to go and get water. It's taking them uh, a toll on illness, on days of labor lost, etc. So one of the things that I think is very hard is bringing all that together in data that is easily understandable, that is short and easy on, in an, on an advocacy basis. Um, you know, it's easier to sort of push for the children's immunization campaign than it is to push for uh, reducing mm -hmm. greenhouse gases, for reducing pollution, uh, for working for cleaner water. Mm -hmm. Well, Shazia, you're right. It is a quandary, and these parliamentarians have to deal with that to try to balance it and to make sure they work on both on both sides of the of the uh, argument or the the situation. You mentioned women. Mm -hmm. That brought to mind the UN Millennium Development Goals, which right. were adopted in 2000. There were eight logical, practical, measurable goals, one to reduce abject poverty by 2015, to promote universal primary school education. The seventh goal dealt with sustainable development, and then another goal dealt with empowering women. Women right. are absolutely critical 
in every society, it doesn't matter where it is, are, are, do you have any programs specifically geared to helping women to empower them even more so they can play even a more positive role? Sure. Um, we worked actually at the start of the process for Beijing with then Congressman, um, Congresswoman, former Congresswoman Bella Abzug. And we worked on the campaign, she used to call it the 180 days, 180 ways uh, to Beijing. Um, so initially we worked on getting more women into the legislature. How do you get women to run for political office? How do you make them more effective once they're there? Um, and what we've been working on since then is to take the role that women legislators are playing in the legislature. Once they're elected, what is it that they're actually doing? What are the bills that they're putting forward? What are the initiatives that they're working on? And publicizing the ones that are in tandem with the UN agreements of Cairo, Beijing, and the Millennium Development Goals as a way of positive reinforcement. At the same time, um, we work with a range of NGOs uh, to provide uh, more technical assistance than we as a small organization can by linking them up at the global level. At the national level, there are several women's organizations, women's bar associations, lawyers who are concerned about women's rights who are coming together to assist legislators um, in meeting their commitments uh, on this. We now, I think, are in a world where, you know, several uh, agencies, uh, both here in the UN as well as elsewhere, governments are now led by women. You know, Jamaica just elected a former PGA member, Portia Simpson as their prime minister. Um, so in a certain sense, we're now at a stage where it is no longer a surprise for a woman to be in a position of authority and responsibility. Now it's a question of what is it that we women will be able to do to deliver that is different from what uh, the world that men created mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. And they do have a major role to play. Absolutely. Now, still not moving away from women because they play a very critical sure. role, but scientific data, there's more and more mounting data that indicates that climate change is here. It is mm -hmm. happening. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of dire predictions as to what will happen in the future. And one of the situations or one of the conditions contributing to climate change really is overpopulation. By 2050, they're projecting, projecting at least 9.5 billion people and maybe even more. What uh, Should we be focusing more on the population situation? Obviously, no one's in favor of coercive population mm -hmm. policies mm -hmm. or anything like that, but should we be talking more about just how many people can planet Earth s S really s sustain? Because as you mentioned, there were a thousand new cars a day being added in Delhi, and that's just one city. And just imagine the resources that are being consumed to build those cars, to operate those cars, and what's happening in New York, Beijing, just all around the world. And right. we can't go on in an unsustainable way with just more and more millions and billions of people. Sure. I mean, I think there's two, three aspects here that are important to work um, in, in sort of coordination. One is that we no longer talk, as you know, about overpopulation. We talk more in terms of you know, focusing on the reproductive health of the woman and the family. So that um, in a sense that when women have access to reproductive health, when women have access to education um, and girls have access to education and families also are able to um, understand that if they space the children uh, in their families, they are going to be able to have a better life for each of those children the population growth naturally begins also uh, to slow down. Um, at the same time, the UN has a very powerful agency, the UN P uh, Fund for Population Activities. We've been working with them since 92. Um, and there again, the focus is on providing women and their families with the um, reproductive health needs uh, that they choose to have. Um, at the same time, I think one of the things that is pretty key is what is the kind of consumption that each individual is going to do? Because if each individual at 7 billion plus decides to consume what I as a New Yorker might do, then we're really in trouble. So I think part of it is also a retraining and an education of those who are already at a developed stage, but also those who are now rapidly developing that you know, there's an aspect to this consumption that should not really be repeated because otherwise we're all in trouble. Mm -hmm. And of course, we're, we're talking about some really important issues and our viewers can go to pgaction.org for the Parliamentarians for Global Action group and find much more information about what we're talking about. I personally am hoping that 
we will be able to come up globally with more practical and enforceable targets that people can agree on. Um, because I think the biggest difficulty in this context uh, when you do these large international meetings is it is a great way of inspiring yourself to go further along certain goals, mm -hmm. but then <laughs> keeping that momentum and sticking to what you've agreed mm -hmm. is very hard. Well, Shazia, Rafi, the, these are very important issues, and the parliamentarians for global action, they certainly have a very valuable role to play in focusing attention on the problems and helping to overcome them. But uh, I want to thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative thank you very program. Thank for having me. Thank you. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us on today's Global Connections program. <laughs>